What's good, you YouTube? It's me, everybody. Squiddy back in another video. Let's talk about Agob for a second in depth now that the full set spoiler has officially landed and this set is dropping in less than two weeks' time. If you guys are going to sneak peek or if you happen to be picking up some boxes of the product, let's take a look at a little tier list, I would say, of the cards that you should emphasize on picking up and then cards that you could maybe wait a little bit to pick up down the line and cards that you should ignore all together entirely. So we have sort of four categories here. The must-have, which I think is the absolute have staples of this set that you definitely want to prioritize picking up at the sneak peek. There are likely good cards that are probably going to be decently good, experimental, but not quite validated as absolute staples in terms of looking at the OCG and in terms of just you know, theorizing on paper, like reading the card effects and seeing what cards are actually going to make an impact on the metagame. We have the has potential, which is, uh, I guess, reserved for cards that are pretty cool, that are not going to make an immediate impact on the metagame, but could come somewhere out of the darkness to make like a little bit of a uh, tech movement, I would say, in the right deck. And then terrible, which is cards that we can pretty much disregard for the time being until something crazy happens in terms of a uh, support that comes out for them further on. So without further ado, at the beginning, I think SP Little Knight, everyone already knows this one is a must-have. Guys, for those of you guys that don't know exactly what this card does, it does a lot more than what the card actually says on its text. There's so many cool plays that you can do with this card. The fact that in tandem with IP Masquerina, this becomes like a uh, effect that can banish from the graveyard or the field as its removal is just nuts. It's a generic Link 2. Even if you don't use like a Link Fusion XYZ or Synchro Monster to make her, you can still use the effect of the Banish, uh, where you get to banish a monster on your field and another monster on the field or your own field as well. So you can either banish two of your own monsters to play around things like Evenly Matched, to dodge removal, or you can even banish your opponent's monster so you always get some value out of this card. It's absolutely insane, and the fact that it's generic is just unheard of, guys. It makes me just wonder, like, if Konami's planning on printing a new type of extra deck monster, because in the end game of XYZs and Synchros, you know they printed out some pretty broken monsters, and now we're kind of, like, in the end game of Lynx. If you compare it to the beginning of when Lynx came out, like, Link 2s, they were not very good. Compared to this, this is just a whole different beast itself in terms of power creep, and this is absolutely a card that I would emphasize that you guys have to pick up. It's probably going to range around $100 on Sneak. But honestly, I would think that it's probably going to be that price if the very least, probably 80 to 100 because this is an absolute staple. And if we kind of look at another staple that's been in the past, uh, Zeus, when that came out, that was around 80 to $90 for the longest time. But that was only used in XYZ decks. Whereas this monster can be used in basically every deck because it's a generic Link monster, so you don't even have to rely on playing XYZs in your deck in the first place. So I could see this card being a solid $100 bill investment. If you guys have the money, just honestly, just pick up this card for Sneak Peek. I don't think it's going to go down that much. And once people realize how good this card is, when it sees some play in future matches, it's just going to go up, I think. So definitely pick up that card. Next, let's talk about the Horus stuff. I would say between likely good and has potential, but honestly, even if it's likely good, it's going to be on the very low spectrum of likely good when it's first released. And then after a couple of events, I actually think it will flow down a tier to uh, being not very good because this engine is actually very volatile. Based on what I've seen from it, it seems like it's really good, okay? Don't get me wrong. It seems like every time you draw uh, this one specifically where you get to discard a card, draw a card, and then add Pharaonic Sarcophagus, you activate Sarcophagus and you bring her back and then you're able to make easy rank eight plays. The issue is you're always investing cards in order to do this. So even though it's two for two, you get Pharaonic Sarcophagus and you draw a card, you have to activate the Pharaonic Sarcophagus in order to bring him back, which is already a card investment, meaning you're still not getting any pluses from there. You're going to have to discard cards in order to foolish the other cards like Happy to bring him back to make a rank eight. But that means that you're going to be investing cards, right? And not every deck has cards to discard. So this is only going to be long in the right deck where you can actually discard cards, in my opinion. So it could be likely good for the time being, but like... You're going to have to have a deck that discards things like Water Enchantress or cards you can make use of in the graveyard. Remember, it discards is cost, so it's not going to trigger any effects of cards like Tier Limits or Dark Worlds. And in a deck like Tier Limits, like, um, cards like this, even if you mill them, it doesn't do anything unless you have access to Pharaonic Sarcophagus. And when you only play one copy of that, that means you're probably going to be pairing it with uh, have, hoping to draw this card specifically in order to... Uh, be able to put that online. And then again, if you get hit with something like an Ash Blossom or even like a Cosmic Cyclone, it kind of just deters that entire engine and turns it off. And then any more copies of horse cards that you draw after that will just be dead, right? Like the diminishing returns on the card are just like so, so bad 
for what the card actually does. I think this engine is very, very mid, to be honest. It's very overhyped, in my opinion. So I don't think it's going to be that good, but we could put it in likely good for now. I think a lot of people will be experimenting with it for the first week or two after the set drops. But afterwards, I think it'll probably fall off. So honestly, I think you guys can probably wait to pick this up unless you're specifically banking on playing a deck that wants to take advantage of making Zombie Vampire or just, you know, big, huge rank eights, right? So yeah, that's where I would put that card for the moment. Okay, let's move on. Talking about the full armored cards. I think these cards actually have potential. For those of you guys that don't know, we're getting a couple of new shark-inspired XYZ cards that you can effectively overlay on top of a rank 4 or a rank 5 or 6, I believe it is. And this card, specifically, like there are a couple of full armor support spell trap cards that are coming out. Those ones are not great, but I think the XYZs are really cool because you're able to make a huge Zeus on top of them. They don't really have any drawbacks. Well, specifically this one, uh, the full armor Dark Ray Lancer. This one, you can just overlay a Zeus on top of that. So that gives you like an extra material. And it becomes 4,000 attack, I believe, when it does have three materials beneath it. So it's just really, really neat that you can instantly slap on a 4,000 attack beater and then make a Zeus on top of that afterwards. So barring any other effects that it has, with the equip that you get to pop. I think just the fact that you can overlay on top and make a fat Zeus has a lot of potential in the right deck. So definitely want to put that there. This is actually really, really cool as well, but the Zark cards that are coming out, so the Supreme Magician Zark support, even though we don't have Electromite for the Pendulum plays, I think the deck could still see some leverage in the TCG because we don't have things like Max C. And in the OCG, this deck is already doing decently well. Now, we know that they have Electromite, but there are some subtle changes in the ban list as well. They don't have the um, Supreme Dark Worm at 3. They have it at 1, whereas we have that card at 3, and we all know that card is really, really powerful. So being able to play it at 3, I think, does have some value over the OCG. And I think there are definitely some decent combos just playing Beyond the Pendulum. I'm not sure what the combos are, but I'm sure that this deck does have some uh, potential down the line. So if you guys want to pick up these cards eventually when no one's really picking them up, I think it's a great way to uh, potentially surprise the metagame with a rogue deck out of nowhere. I actually think that the Watts have high potential. Now, this sounds crazy, but for those of you guys that don't know, we're getting new Watts support in the form of Watt Tuna that says if you inflict battle damage to your opponent via an attack, you can special summon this card from your hand at the end of the damage step. And then this card can also attack directly. Now, it has another effect where when it attacks directly, you can actually tribute Watt Monsters to go into a free Watt Synchro from your extra deck. But the effect that we really care about is the fact that you can summon it out of your hand. And it's actually tutorable off a older Watt card called Watt Cobra, which is a level 4 that says this monster can attack directly. If this monster inflicts battle damage to your opponent via a direct attack, you can add a Watt Monster from your deck to your hand meaning you can add Watuna from your deck to your hand. And because Watuna says at the end of the damage step, you can actually special summon that added Watuna from your hand to your field immediately. So that means you get a free rank four at the cost of your battle phase. So you can effectively side Wat Cobra going second with a copy of Watuna to make a free rank four, like a Baguska or something, really easily into a board that doesn't have any Omni Negates. I just think that this is really, really cool. And at the same time, you're able to deal a whopping 1800 damage to your opponent directly. So that could be helpful in time. But the fact that it has a one card rank four is really hard to achieve in this game. Like right now, we only have things like the Super Heavy Samurai, which has a lot of drawbacks. But this, unfortunately, the drawback is you take up your battle phase, but we're still dealing some damage at least. And we're also able to uh, put on a really, really condensed engine, right? Just playing like four cards, even four or five cards. And then just getting out that Watuna just has a lot of value. And Watuna is not really a brick because you can also attack with other monsters. As long as you deal battle damage, you can special some of them out as a free extender. There's no drawback. So I think that's really, really cool. And a lot of people have kind of looked past that. So definitely Watts have a lot of potential, I would say. Next, talking about Ogdo Addicts. Actually, if you think about it, there are a lot of things that actually have support a lot of potential in this set and i think odoagics are no exception to that we're actually getting a new card that allows you to bring itself back from the graveyard when a card is sent from the hand or graveyard or deck to the graveyard so it's really really cool it pairs very well with the rest of the odoagics that are existing i can't say this name but there's also a spell card that allows you to tribute a reptile monster you control and then special summon tokens equal to every two levels that it has so you, if you tribute a level eight you get four tokens and there's no drawback on that card so it's really really cool that you're able to instantly start playing just with uh these two cards that that synergize really well with the existing cards that we have for reptiles so i think there's definitely some potential there to test out especially now that arise heart's gone so we have the graveyard back at our disposal 
This card, the Burfomet, the Great Wings, well, the Illusion Wings. This card is actually very, very powerful. You can make it with any two Illusion, Beast, or Fiend monsters with different names. And then when he's Fusion Summoned, you can actually Foolish a Fiend, an Illusion, or a Beast directly from your deck. So I think this has a lot of potential because previously when we had two Illusions in our hand or like uh, an Illusion... Like, if we had two illusions in our hand, we could not use Polymerization to fuse into anything useful besides Guardian Chimera, right? But now we can actually use Polymerization to instantly go into that. And as well as having Chimera Fusion, we can actually use Gazelle plus any illusion monster to just make this, which is really, really cool because the deck was kind of missing that little piece in the extra deck. A lot of times you didn't have anything to go into besides Guardian Chimera. And when you didn't have a way to get a monster on the board, that could be made really hard. But now you can easily make this card that allows you to also resurrect a banished beast fiend or illusion monster by banishing it from your graveyard so you can actually use it in tandem with chimera the flying phantom beast and then banish that to revive something from your graveyard and then banish this to revive back that chimera so it's really really cool that it kind of loops that back into play and being able to foolish anything from your deck is just so cool that you can actually foolish cards like tri brigade nerval so there's some synergy there i think it's really really cool and i definitely think this is a card that will likely be good the TG stuff, I think it's between likely good and has potential. I want to say likely good for now, just because I think a lot of people will be experimenting with this. And Synchro plays are actually quite devastating. I don't know how susceptible the deck is to Nibiru specifically, but I know it has a lot of 1 and 1 1.5 card combos. So maybe if this is actually solved, I think it could be potentially good to be like tier 2 status, maybe tier 2.5. So I think it's likely good for now, maybe at the tail end but it's still good enough, I think, at least for the first couple of weeks of the metagame before we see what happens. DML star stuff, this is very likely good. I mean, it's between likely good and must have. We'll put it at the top of likely good. Now, the difference between this and the OCG is the fact that we don't have Chaos Ruler anymore. I mean, neither does the OCG, but when they had these cards initially when Agov dropped, they had Chaos Ruler, meaning that Diabella Star could be splashed into a lot of decks because she's a level 7, so being able to summon out a Jet Synchron means you can make an easy Synchro 8 in the form of Chaos Ruler. But now that we do not have Chaos Ruler, there are not a lot of good level 8 Synchros to go into, if I'm being honest with you. Something like a Cyframe Gear, Cyframe Omega doesn't really cut it anymore, right, in today's metagame. So I think specifically it'll be very good in decks that can make use of summoning out a level 1 Fire Monster, like in Rescue Ace, for example, summoning out Hydrant. But in the rest of the decks, it doesn't really seem like it doesn't have a lot of synergy. Just being able to, just being forced to shoehorn in like three copies of the Sinful Spoils and then the e Tally Sinful Spoil and then one or two copies of Diabell Star and then a copy of Jet Synchron. It's like there are a lot of diminishing returns. So I'm not sure if that's really worth it for all of the decks like Tier Laments. But I think in the right deck that can actually summon out an engine piece like Rescue Fire Hydrant is really, really powerful. So in my opinion, this is still a really, really good engine and you can make so much use of what it does. Uh, you can also draw a card off of the Sinful Spoils card in the graveyard, so that's also really, really good. The Visa stuff is, well, eh. I want to say it has potential. I know a lot of Yugi tubers were kind of doing combos with this card, specifically in like a Tier Limit slash Manadia Mishmash deck, but I'm not really sure if extra copies of Visa Starfrost is really what would solve the deck's problems, but I think it's really, really cool that you can do a lot with it. Being a normal summonable Visa Starfrost is just neat, so I think it definitely has some potential, but whether or not it'll make a significant impact leaves a lot to be said, I think. So yeah, we'll leave that there for now. The Vanquish Soul support is actually really, really cool. I think it has a lot of potential in the deck, and it's probably between likely good and has potential, especially in the Vanquish Soul deck, because this monster allows you to add a Vanquish Soul card from your deck to your hand by revealing two fire monsters. It's really, really cool. So now we have more fire monsters to reveal, and we also have a trap card that allows you to do some cool things like Ragaiki nuke the entire board. So I think it's definitely something that Vanquish Souls could explore playing. Now, I'm not a Vanquish Soul player myself, so I'm not sure exactly how good it'll be. But I think he's good enough that he'll definitely see some play in the Vanquish Soul, at least for the first couple of weeks, testing out whether he's good or not. And just having another name is just always a good thing, right? He's a free extender that can be special summoned out when you do reveal a Vanquish Soul monster's effect from the hand. So it's just really, really neat that you're instantly able to get another body on the board to make some Link or uh, Overlay plays. The... Well, Nubel stuff. I think it has potential. It's not the best, okay? But specifically, these Nubel cards that are coming out, there's the spell card that allows you to special summon the new Pendulum Monster to your side of the field, and then the Pet Test Seal card to your opponent's side of the field. And you can actually set up both scales now off that one card when you do pop that 
uh, card that you special summon your opponent's side of the field, so you can now Pendulum Summon. And then when this new card, the Chef of Nouvelles, is summoned, you can actually add a Ritual Spell um, recipe card or a level one ritual directly from your deck to your hand. So it's really, really neat what it does. And it's a free extender as well that you can then tribute off and place in your pendulum zone. So I think this card actually has some potential. Now we know that new bells are obviously not that great, but I think the deck, now that it has these cards specifically, does a lot more. And it could definitely see some play, you know, like hopefully D Barrier gets a nuke eventually because ritual decks kind of get caught in the crossfire. But I think the deck is really, really fun. It's a lot of uh, entertaining card art and it just does a lot of cool things for a ritual deck. So this support actually is very, very powerful for that specific archetype. So I think it has some potential. Now, we all know there's nothing in the terrible spot yet, but I think we all can agree that the <laughs> um, Tistina cards are not that great, at least what we've been spoiled. Sorry, guys, I know I said to pick these up in the past couple of videos, and I mean, in my defense, hey, the cards did go up because of the hype from the card art, and I think they're still going up now that the cards have been spoiled, but the new spoiled cards have not been very great at all. There's no real starters nor synergy with the cards. Konami R&D gave us a bunch of Tiskina Trap cards, and it's like, eh, we have cards that are gaining attack and want to attack going second, but now we also have traps. There's some counterintuitivity there, but that being said, we might actually get more support. We might get a broken OCG exclusive like we did for the rest of the TCG archetypes in the past. So that could just drive it over the edge. Like imagine we get something along the lines of Beatrice for Burning Abyss for Tistina that somehow ties the entire salad together. Then maybe the deck will actually be good. So I wouldn't rule them out yet. I mean, they're terrible now. But maybe in a month or two time when we get some more detail on the Tistinas and some more lore, we might actually get some more cards for it and then it'll be actually good. Because I feel like they're still missing one more thing to actually make it that like better, right? Like it, there's no way they're going to make an archetype that's TCG exclusive with like 10 or more cards be this terrible, guys. So have some faith in Konami. We'll see what happens. The new butler for the Labyrinth archetype. I think this has a lot of potential, actually. Probably some high potential. I have seen some OCG recipes actually play this card at three. He can resurrect himself from the graveyard directly when your opponent responds to one of your Labyrinth effects, which is very, very easy to do in like a grind game, right? They're forced to respond to certain effects. And then being able to discard this off with a Stovey Torby or a Shan Draglier allows you to bring them back constantly and then also set cards that you draw into off of the uh, rest of your Labyrinth cards, uh, like Ariana, and then set cards, set the trap card, and activate it on the same turn. So I think it definitely has some potential. Whether or not it fits into the TCG builds, it's hard to say right away, but I think it's something that has a lot of uh, cool choices for people to play around with, and it definitely has some potential. The Manadium Synchro card. I think this card actually is very, very powerful because of the fact that it enables a lot of one card, well, basically pseudo OTKs with a huge full combo, one card full combo off of one Realm Heart now. This card is insane. It's a level six Synchro monster that allows you to easily go into the Visa's uh, Starfrost Synchro monster, Visa's Amritara, and it just does so much for the deck. I think this is really, really cool, and it kind of pushes it over the edge, so hopefully you guys get some side deck cards ready for that deck, like Drone Lockbirds. Yeah, I might have to eat my words there on Droll. Okay, the Typhon Star Crisis card, this card is an absolute must-have in my opinion. This card is insane for the sheer fact that, have you guys ever had a game where you feel like, okay, I'm going second, I basically have everything to break my opponent's board, but I was just short one card to actually be in the game and prevent them from pushing back, and this card now allows you to do that because this is an extra deck card that says if your opponent special summon two or more times from the extra deck previously on the previous turn, you can actually bring out this card for free on top of any one of your monsters that has the highest attack. However, However, you can't summon for this turn, so it's a balanced card that you would do at the very end of your sequencing and then be able to use the effect as well to non-targeting bounce back any monster on the field. This is really neat because you don't have to bounce your opponent's cards, you can also bounce your own. So if you have ways to special summon out like an effect veiler or a hand trap, you can actually bring it back to your hand and reuse that. And yeah, Typhon's just a really, really unique card that does a lot for every deck, so I think it's definitely something everyone should pick up. And then Shino Baroness cards, I think, are pretty terrible from what I've read. I don't really know the full extent of their deck, but it seems like they're not great. And being a ritual deck, it's caught between D barrier stuff, so not much to say there. Last but not least, Gen and Ken, the Dragon Warrior and the Diamond Tiger, respectively. These cards are very likely good, in my opinion. You've already seen the hype that this, these cards have generated over the past 24 hours to 48 hours when the cards have been spoiled. And everyone says that these guys just turn on Thrust and Talents, as well as Dark World cards. So decks like... 
Dark World and Purely that can take advantage of these cards, I think will be very, very powerful. But you can't slot them into every deck, right? It has to be a deck where you have to rely not heavily on your normal summoning, so you can actually make room for these guys normal summon them and take advantage of their effects. They're not going to be absolute staples in every deck, but I think they're really, really cool to play around with. And the fact that it turns off things like evenly matched going first as well is really, really unique. So there's not a lot of counterplay to these cards if you do draw them. The caveat is you do have to play them in the right deck where you can actually draw into Thrust Talents or a Dark World card or something to benefit off of this card. So that being said, I think they're likely good, probably in the higher spectrum of likely good, but time will tell once we see what decks these will be slotted into. That's about it, all I had for Squidio. Do you guys have any cards that we missed in the Squidio in Agov? Let us know in the comments below. Other than that, let me know your thoughts, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.